Right, I am Shunyi, and I have recently discovered that there is another universe out there. The universe has a very different physics that we're not familiar with. Now, consequently, pe beings in that universe has a very different notion of computation when compared to us. We will call that universe Universe B because ours is Universe A for obvious reasons. <laughs> now, now, in Universe B, things are made of particles, much like ours. But the difference is that these particles have some notion, limited form of cognition. Now, I mentioned that these particles have limited forms of cognition because when many such particles come together, um, the collective levels of cognition increases. And so far, there's no known limit as to how far uh, how big can one such conglomeration get before the cognitive uh, intelligence no, lo in, no longer increases? So it's, it's like space, right? So this conglomeration may move from one space to another place, and they may occasionally uh, encounter another conglomeration. So when this happens, the particles that make up a conglomeration, they suddenly find the ability to duplicate themselves, like this one does. Um, and it's these duplicated particles that interact with one another. Uh, most of the duplicated particles, the individual duplicated particles, will not survive the encounter, leading to um, three um, conglomerations at the end. The original two and the smaller, usually smaller, uh, third conglomeration. Occasionally, the third smaller conglomeration may not be able to move, as, as if it's stuck in place. Uh, we'll come back to that later. So a conglomeration of such particles, according to their culture, uh, they make a bleating noise, and, and they call themselves lambda. <laughs> right. Now, there is an ether in this universe. Uh, the, the thing is, these lambdas don't know about the ether. Their version of the Michelson-Morley experiment showed that there is no ether, but from our universe, it's quite obvious that there is an ether. This is because when they move through space, they leave a trail, a gap that opens in the ether and sort of eventually closes. Right. And this is how they end up being able to communicate with us. They can simply trace out through space um, words that are intelligible to us. Uh, the best way for me to describe this ether is like it's a, it's a jam-like substance. Uh, when they move, it's like something in, in moving in a jar of jam. So here you've got a, a universe full of lambdas and a jam-like ether, a, a lambda jam, if you will. And it's a very strange place to be. <laughs> you see, there is more than one notion of individuality, and not much is known about their particles, so I'm just going to use a pronoun he for reasons. Uh, so there's this individual, we don't know whether he's a particle or a conglomeration. Um, he's a scientist and he's traced out his own name, Baron Zoe J. Church. And he comes from a line of scientists who has discovered that their movement through space is essentially computation. And this guy, uh, he basically discovered that computation requires the ether. Now, by now, it should be obvious that I was not actually talking about an alien universe there. I mean, all those pictures, right? I was describing an embellished version of our universe. Specifically, I was actually describing ink on paper. Uh, at the same time, I was also describing lambda terms. But at the same time, I'm also describing computation from a point of view of statistical mechanics. You see, a conglomeration that does not move when I said that is what you call a steady state in statistical mechanics. And the ether is simply a description of a context that holds the steady state. Another word for this is memory. If you're familiar with Markov chains, we say that Markov chains do not have a me uh, memory less. So from a physics point of view, a computation is simply a modification of these steady states. Uh, these steady states, we say, are held in a medium which we can call a substrate. And there can be many, many different kinds of substrates. My personal interest comes from artificial neural networks. You see, I noticed that you can't really describe lambda calculus in artificial neural networks. You can build neural Turing machines, you can't build neural lambda calculus. Why is that? Well, realizability theory says that lambda calculus is less realizable than Turing machines, uh, and lambda calculus cannot realize itself. But we're at Lambda Jam, and we're not at a constructive mathematics conference, so I'm going to take a slightly softer stance and I'm, I'm mainly saying this because I don't want you to help me with eggs, right? So to answer that question again, we need to look at how we model computation. We have many ways of modeling computation. And in, an informal way of thinking about a comp computational model is that the models describe the computation that they're doing. Listed on screen is um, a list of sequential linear models of computation. All right? 
side note, there's of course a university where everything happens concurrently. We'll not talk about them, but there is a particular model of concurrent um, computation that I'm actually quite excited about, uh, propagators, which Ed Kmet is going to give a talk about today. Go see his talk. Now, we say that a model of computation is good if you can use it and describe computation without having to rely on a description of its substrate. For example, we can describe uh, using um, the language of Turing machines to describe computation that happens in a bucket of water or artificial neural networks. And so I think people in this room might find it surprising that I list lambda calculus to be a bit less substrate independent than you, you would expect. And what I mean by this is that we tend to take the substrate that we're doing a computation on for granted. Let me explain. So in lambda calculus, in pure lambda calculus, uh, when you're doing a computation, it, it, it's done by means of term rewriting. This term, um, this application, reduces to lambda y dot a. We say here that a computation has been done. And the rules of lambda calculus, plus together with the terms of lambda calculus, describes the computation. You guys following? Excellent. Now, we will, of course, be uh, term rewriting is a very, very human thing to do. Um, it relies on the fact that we have taken for granted. We can see on paper, on the screens, our computational substrate, which x to replace in one look. We will, of course, have to be more careful when we're reasoning around bound variables. But more or less, we, re we humans rewrite terms by just looking, right? And bear in mind that pure lambda calculus was invented when there were no physical computers. Um, so computers cannot do term rewriting in the same way that we do. So we need to instill some discipline in ourselves to see how a computer may reduce such a term. Um, let's go through this step by step. First, the computer checks if this term is a redex. If it's a redex, it goes on and it reduces. Good. Then it checks if there's a name clash. If there's a name clash, an alpha conversion needs to be done. Otherwise, go on. There is no name clash here, so we move on. So now the computer becomes ready to replace all values of x with a. And so what it does is it takes out uh, lambda y dot x from the original per, per the beta rule, and then does a substitution of x. Now we have the answer. The gorilla moment is now. Who here noticed that all the heavy lifting was done outside of the boxes? All right. See, right, so that is the notion that a computation has to be done outside the computation that we have, uh, we have defined here. So that's what I mean in this sense that lambda calculus requires a notion of substrate. It is not free from the meta theory that you need alpha renaming, blah, blah, blah. And at this point, it, it may be a bit you know, nitpicky for me to say, Oops, sorry. It, it may be a bit, I'm, I'm a bit nitpicky and say, well, that's, that's what a computer is supposed to do. A computational substrate is supposed to keep track of the context of execution. Well, that seems to be a fact of life when you're trying to implement um, lambda calculus based functional programming languages. Which brings me to the next point. No computation can be done free of context. Computation is always done in context. Let me show you an example. Here is a very simple uh, program. On the left, we call, we call this a program. On the right, we call this a user input. And when you run this program with the input, you get A. But what is A? Well, A is a free variable in the original program, so it can represent any value. Without a further context, we cannot understand what this program does. It's simply a program that returns something. What's something? I don't know. It's undefined. We have not defined it. The context, of course, is provided by us at the meta level. So the usual, the usual examples of talking about um, context in pure lambda calculus always talks about uh, variable capture. You know that I did not go down that, through that path. That's because this simple program is very uh, instructive of the bigger picture of what I mean when I say computation requires context. B, we note it's a free variable in, in this term. right? From the outside context, uh, we have mentioned earlier that B is a user input. So we can see that, uh, we can infer from this is A is some, some, somehow a user input as well. And it eventually bubbles up to the user to provide the final context. Hello? So when we think about it this way, we can say that a free variable is a degree of freedom that requires the meta components of context. There are other examples of free variable. Um, the computational variable, which is the, the kind of variable that C programmers are used to, then Python programmers are used to, um, or if you're into quantum computing, a quantum observable is a degree of freedom. 
Now, I've already hinted how we may resolve this degrees of freedom thing. Degrees of freedom are re resolved by simply having a context to do your computation in. Remember the story I told you earlier, the computation requires the ether. Well, the ether is, of course, an analogy for the context. I think I've actually mentioned that. Ooh, spoilers. Now, compiler writers are actually very, very clear on this notion of having a context. We solve the first problem by saying lambda x dot a is not allowed to be written. We will cause a compiler error. Furthermore, when you're compiling functional languages like Haskell or OCaml, you have to eventually do a closure conversion step, which, which translates everything into a closure so that the environment may be held in the heap. And then at runtime, we just fill up the, heap, the holes in the heap. Follow so far? Cool. Now, this is, of course, a perfect segue for me to introduce closure calculus. Closure calculus is a lambda calculus that was introduced by Barry J last year, and it's quite a beautiful piece of uh, calculus that has everything that makes pure lambda calculus such an attractive uh, calculus for, for describing computation. It's a confluent theory of functions, much like pure lambda calculus, and therefore it allows us to replace equals with equals, equational reasoning, and it's Turing complete in that there is a proof that uh, progress and preservation happens, which of course was done in Koch. After Phil's talk later, workshop later, I will try to, a version of this in Agda. But the best thing about uh, closure calculus when compared with the other kinds of lambda calculi out there is that you can now describe computation without having to rely on the underlying computational substrate. Or in Barry's words, no meta theory. Now, the forms of the terms are very simple, very similar to that of pure lambda calculus. X is, as usual, a variable symbol. Uh, then you've got your applications. But then you've got this weirder looking stuff like the, the add symbol, which we call a tagged application. I will explain more on that later. And then you've got the identity operator. And the last thing at the, bit, uh, at the bottom is the extension syntax, which serves dual purposes as both the environment and an explicit substitution. Uh, we won't be delving too deeply into that because there are some very interesting implications on that. But what I want to point out is that there, there is only one form of abstraction that's available, and that's the closure. Uh, so now we can, we, can, we can compare this with the notion of an abstraction in pure lambda calculus. Right? So this is how we write an abstraction in pure lambda calculus. And when I was younger, I used to be quite annoyed at people when people say this is a function. No, 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 this is not a function. A lambda, the, the, the bit highlighted in gold, is something that produces a function that binds the variable x to the body t. That's a big difference. So in the story I told earlier, I mentioned that when two conglomerations um, interact with each other, they duplicate their inner particles, and the inner particles are the ones that actually interact. This is how I think of lambda terms. So in closure calculus, it creates a lambda creates a closure, which is a function and an environment. We write the environment in sigma and boxes. And so far, everything we've seen here is an abstract syntax. Let's look at a concrete version of this uh, closure abstraction. This is the identity function. And it's lambda, pure lambda calculus equivalence is this. Now, I want to be careful here. When I say it's equivalent, I don't mean that. Uh, I mean it in an informal sense, right? Uh, this, notion of, this informal notion of equivalence will get tested in a bit. And I'm also using this symbol here not because that there is a natural transform. No, it's because PowerPoint has a paucity of symbols that, that's available to you. Now, the i in the, um, in the box is an identity operator. And the identity operator helps with the reduction of terms, which we'll briefly cover later. But what happens when you have more than one name being bound in an environment? We write it like this. y is mapped to 1. Note that the rough equivalence, the, the, the the informal notion of equivalence still has not changed because the function is still the same. The closure simply captures more names. Following so far? Excellent. So this is a basic overview of the terms of closure calculus. The next slide showing the reduction rules is a bit scary. <laughs> yeah, um, so pure lambda calculus has between one and three reduction rules, whether or not you believe uh, the eta expansion should be considered as part of this, the set of rules. All right. Who are we kidding? We, we all believe that functions, everything is made of functions, so we have to acknowledge the eta um, reduction rule. So three rules. Lambda calculus, pure lambda calculus has three rules. So this version of closure calculus has 10 reduction rules. And out of the 10, two of them has meta theory, uh, which is to do variable symbol checking. Right? There is another version of closure calculus with 11 rules and zero meta theory. Of course, 
That version is not amenable to the visual analysis that we have been doing here so far. But the result is now we have a lambda calculus whose names stay stable throughout the reduction. This fact is something, the, the fact that you can trust names has a number of um, implications. But first, why does closure calculus matter? I offer you two reasons, simpler and faster. Recall once again that a computation is never done without a context. A closure calculus removes all the meta operation, all the meta theory. So now a computation that is described by closure calculus is truly free from any dependence of substrate. In practical terms, what this means is we can now mechanize this calculus much easier than we can mechanize uh, pure lambda calculus. I'm the kind of the guy who likes to beat dead horse, so once again, let's use free variables as an example. Free variables in closure calculus is truly free everywhere. What do I mean by this? Well, consider these two terms. The one on top is written in closure calculus. The one on the bottom is written pure lambda calculus. We're, we're, we're interested in the highlighted variable x. Uh, so now my question is this, is x free? Well, in the pure lambda calculus, it is context sensitive, right? x is free in the inner context. Yeah, it's not free here. Of course, this makes figuring things out like capture avoidance a bit more complicated because now you need a stack when you tra traverse your term. You need to keep track of which names have been bound uh, and captured by the external context. And in really, really big terms, it's not actually easy to see whether a variable has been captured or not. In con by contrast, in closure calculus, x is free here. x is also free here. Now, the presence of free variables, as we have already mentioned, makes Reduction's a bit funny. It makes things that don't make sense, right? So we should not expect our reductions to make sense either. From this point of view, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a very strange thing, right? But we can, of course, remedy this um, by simply adding a mapping of a variable to itself like this. Now, the reduction happens and works correctly. If you're a compiler writer uh, who works in functional languages, you might go, hmm, that looks familiar. Because the mapping of x to itself is some, a very familiar thing that compilers do. For example, this is SDG's uh, notion of it. Um, SDG creates a new, um, I forgot what this is called. But basically, the list of free variables, oh yeah, f is, is, a, is a closure. I forgot, f is a closure in the heap. And the body is appointed to code in the heap. And each free variable in this list is appointed to a memory location that holds a value. In short, it is an environment. Note that this x in the environment, the mapping of x to itself, is a free variable. It's a degree of freedom. And how do we implement degrees of freedom's computational variables? Well, we, we implement it by putting it as a memory, a pointer to some memory location. It's exactly the same thing. So what of the free variable now that we've added a mapping to itself? How are we to interpret this? Well, we, one, one way we can interpret this is that this is free in the, con uh, in the function, but it's bound in the closure, right? But remember, the only form of abstraction that you get in closure calculus is the closure. So the notion of having free in a, in a function does not really matter that much. And this makes mechanizing closure calculus a lot simpler because now the terms are self-contained. They, they know everything about their environment. They know everything about the function. So there are simpler, simply fewer things to worry about. And there's also another fact about closure calculus that leads itself quite well to compilation in the sense that closure calculus allows for recursive programs to be written in normal form. Now, I see a few raised eyebrows, so yes. And by normal form, I mean the OG definition of normal form. I don't mean normal forms like we can normal forms. I mean literally forms that cannot be reduced further by the rules of the calculus. At this point, I want to make a slight detour um, that has not been really explored in functional programming. Uh, Phil did mention a bit about it, but I'm talking about the inverse. Phil talks about animation, I'm talking about free freezing. All lambda calculi have frozen forms. Agree? A frozen form is simply what we write down, either on pen or paper, or we represent them in bits in machine memory, right? Frozen forms are not necessarily normal form forms. So why am I bringing up this notion of a frozen form? See, 
Functional programming languages traditionally do not have a notion of compiled versus interpreted programs. Reduction is reduction is reduction. Many people consider it a shame that you have to do a compilation step, but guess what? We live in a universe where the von Neumann metaphor is the de facto. So we have to take that into account, right? So when we look at the reduction, now we can think of reductions happening in two phases. Both are reductions, but we separate the phases. At the compile time, we want to reduce as much as possible, and we can also do some metaprogramming like type inference, type checking, that sort of thing, and, and it's various rewrites that come with it. So we, we do all this so that at runtime, we can do as little work as possible. Is this clear? Good. So in between, uh, in between compilation and runtime, we freeze. We write it down as a binary and put it in the hard drive. Right? That, and that's it. So recall from earlier that the forms of closure calculus is as on screen. The normal forms is simply this exact thing sans the standard application. Now, having introduced normal forms, let's see what happens when you put a term that is not in normal form through an aggressively normalizing closure calculus interpreter. When this program puts, gets put through my interpreter, it will do the naughty thing and try to uh, reduce under the lambda, which results in a normal form, which is the identity function, yeah? And having the ability to write programs in normal forms is very important. We can say to the programmer, okay, the tagged application, the add symbol, is how you stop reductions at compile time. So I, at this point, I want to also point out that the, the tagged application has no bearing on how the final program is evaluated. These two programs evaluate to A at runtime. But if we say, OK, now we've got two phases of reduction, one at compile time, let's look at and see what the compiled versions of these programs look like. Well, one is simpler and one is not. Right? And this only works because the only way to remove a frozen term, an at uh, tagged application, is to apply a substitution. And the only way to get a substitution is by the equivalent of a beta reduction. Now. I want to be very careful with what I said here. I, I mentioned multiple times aggressively normalizing. This is not the same as strongly normalizing. If you write this uh, program and put it through a compiler of closure calculus, it will never terminate. You will never get a binary out. We can, of course, stop the com com uh, compiler from going into crazy recursiveness by adding an at here. But now this is a useless term because we cannot remove the, the tag. So what can we do? to get recursive programs in normal form? Well, turns out Mr. Turing has the solution for us. Uh, you can actually rewrite the, the Turing's Y combinator as a, as, a, as a term that stops at compile time. And this Y combinator, Turing's Y combinator, is actually quite useful to us, even if it's a toy to play around with you know, recursion. So to reiterate, this is why we bother with programs in normal form. Okay? We don't have to figure out when to freeze the program. We don't have to figure out weak head normal forms that solve things. We don't have to figure out an evaluation strategy. We can say aggressively normalize everything. Right? And this causes programs to be faster at runtime. So now you might say, OK, Shani, you, you're just posturing. This is, this, is, you know, this is all theoretical stuff, all stuff in your head. Well, the good news is I actually have some results. I've previously mentioned, or through social contact, that my, my motivation in life is to build an AGI. Therefore, understanding computation that is free from substrate is key. It also may not surprise you that I have my own deep learning library. Um, and the next few versions of the companion library will be built on top of notions from Closure Calculus. Now, I'm not here to plug my own software library. Most of you probably do not like Go, something, something generics. But I also took the time to implement a closure calculus interpreter in three different languages, Go, Haskell, and Camel. Um, the results that you will see here will be from the Go version because of sheer controllability. And what I mean by controllability is that I want to play Laplace's demon. I want to know where every bit of memory is when a program is running. right? And, and I want to do it in such a way that I implement everything from scratch without any reliance on built-in library. The idea for this is I want to see how easy it is to build a lambda calculus interpreter versus a lambda calculus, uh, a closure calculus interpreter. How does it look? Well, closure calculus is both simpler to implement and it is simpler. Yeah. Closure calculus is also faster. 
I benchmark closure calculus interpreters with the PLM, various versions of the pure lambda uh, interpreter using the Fibonacci program, and as well as other programs from the NoFib benchmark from Haskell. And all the interpreters were augmented with delta rules uh, for, for natural numbers and if then else. The results are stunning. Closure calculus is five times faster than pure lambda calculus. Now, I did some digging in and figuring out why. And mainly, it's because I did not memoize um, alpha conversion. I did not figure out the alpha normalization trick. Um, and a lot of time is spent in the meta theory of lambda calculus. Now, you may say, OK, that's cheating. You're, you're not doing the standard thing. But bear in mind that this native, naive version of uh, the pure lambda calculus interpreters it already takes more lines of code to implement compared to the interpreter for closure calculus. If you want to add all these things to make lambda calculus fast, pure lambda calculus faster, well, you're just going to make it more complicated, right? And also for the sheer fun of it, I also benchmarked um, closure calculus interpreters with Haskell's. It's, um, it's about 30% the speed of a compiled language, which is not too shabby. So why did I benchmark against Haskell? Well. Because of the way the benchmarks were originally designed, they were originally the, the, the first interpreter was written in Haskell, but because I suck at writing programs in Haskell, I do, uh, Criterion did, gave me very, very inconsistent results. And so there eventually turns out there are too many knobs to play around with the runtime. Uh, so yeah, that's my fault. But deterministic benchmarking is difficult. Anyways, all the benchmarks start their lives as Haskell programs. They're then translated into pure lambda calculus. Um, so an example is this. This is a Haskell fib. It gets translated into pure lambda calculus, where you need to rewrite it in terms of the y combinator. And from this, you can reasonably retrieve the pure lambda terms. And then it's translated into closure calculus, where the y2 combinator is used. And that's, that's the reason why I decided to benchmark against Haskell. Now, as a bit of a trivia, there's a, there's a primes function on the Haskell homepage that shows how nice and simple Haskell is. Obviously, you need to benchmark this. Uh, what ended up on, 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 the, on the table earlier is the Delta Rules version. But the original version I did was the Scott encoding of pure lambda calculus numbers. And I will tell you that it is fun. It's about 700 lines of Haskell. Not fun. And if you are up for a challenge, you can always also invoke no implicit prelude. It makes your life a lot harder. But you know what? The default prelude is kind of crappy. Now, as we come to an end, I would like to recap what this talk has been all about. I started a story about an alien universe. The twist, of course, is that the alien universe is ours, and I was actually describing ink on paper, a computational substrate. Right? We also learn from this parable and various examples that computation cannot happen without a context. Then I mentioned that pure lambda calculus does not adequately capture a notion of computation that is free from its substrate. And this manifests itself when we try to simulate lambda calculus on Turing machines by needing meta theory. So, what is the ask? Well, the ask is simple. Closure calculus is better. There is no meta theory. It, it's a simpler compiler that, that results in simpler compilers that produces faster programs, right? Um, th that's because we can we can say okay, aggressively normalize all things. So the ask is simple. We should all be using variants of closure calculus as the basis of our functional programming languages. Now, some of you might say that um, the only good Calculus is a type cal typed calculus. Well, we got you, fam. The future is coming. We've got a type for lambda. And for now, thank you. Fantastic. We've got one minute for a question, which I know someone has. Oh, wow. Um, so in your system, if I wrote omega uh, without a tagged application, would the compiler just hang? Uh, it depends on the way you wrote the tag. Um, yeah, it depends on the way you wrote the program. I actually have if, to If see. I wrote the naive omega but without a tagged application to set it to a normal form, like yeah. the aggressive normalization would just keep running yes, forever. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, OK. <laughs> cool. One more? No. Hi, awesome talk. Um, so I believe some of these issues around uh, context independence and naming led to the development of combinator calculi, like SK. Yes. How do you feel that compares to closure, closure calculus? So 
Over here, I say via abstraction calculus. Cool. So yeah, there, there is a way. Um, Barry's all about abstract, like the abstraction calculus, right? Closure calculus is like a sidetrack 